Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. friends and listeners welcome to well this is a very 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 special episode it's the fifth anniversary episode well the special edition for the fifth anniversary of the sauce hermes podcast and today is really the very day that we launched um, the thought hermes podcast i launched the thought hermes podcast i may say that day was april the 20th 2017 i was very nervous when i kicked the button in and alan richardson's episode the interview i made with him went online it was quite a moment and um i have to think now how many listeners did i have in that first week back then let me look that up i have it all here yes indeed first week gave us 358 listeners. Well, that's not too bad for a first week, I think. And uh, well, second week down to 168. And well, then it came slowly up and up. Today we are close to 5,000 a week. And that's thanks to all of you and all the people that are talking about the Salsbury podcast, about all the guests I had in those five years. And today is the moment to thank you all, to thank you, um, you listeners, you have become the main core of this podcast and there is more and more of you, as I just said, every week. Thanks to all the guests that have appeared here. We have had uh, roughly 122 episodes so far with really very, very interesting guests. The who's who of the occult world has been here, I am happy to say, and I'm really also happy that we have made quite a few discoveries people maybe who were not so well known in the first place who have appeared here for the first time and that's also really something that i like um and then i need to say thanks to the supporters of you to the patrons who support us here and i'm not going to ask everyone else to become a patron now it would be nice though if you did but um, no, that's not for the anniversary episode. So, um, you know, this is an intermediate episode. And it's at the same time, while it is launched here on the regular podcast channel, it will also air at exactly 3.30 Vienna time on this Wednesday, April 20th. It will air for the first time on the new Kaikobad radio. I'm not going to talk too much on this show because it's already long enough and we will uh, have uh, to to stay a bit tight now in these announcements. But um, go and listen on the website uh, to what I have to say about Kegobat Radio or go to Kegobat Radio itself. Every eight hours when the loop starts again for this first week, you will hear my introduction. But I think I will also put it on Facebook and so on. So you can know a bit more what Kaikobat Radio is going to be and is from now on. Um, so all new things here and my guest here today on this very special show. Well, actually, yes, it's one guest, but two people we're going to meet because at this occasion I am doing my second Trio, what I call trio. I did a first one with Greg Kaminsky as my co host, and today it's Carl Abrahamson who will be my co host when we are going to meet Lionel Snell in a moment. And at first, uh, enough talking for the moment, let's delve into the episode right away. But of course, I have to announce what music we're going to play. You know what? The first piece of music, I'm not going to announce it. I'll tell you afterward what it was, because I suppose many of you, at least those who have been listening to the early episodes, will recognize that music immediately. I hope so. 
Okay, so without further ado, let's start this episode, this anniversary episode, special episode for the Thoth Hermit's anniversary. Let's start with some music. Enjoy. When you have faded
Okay, so did you recognize the music? Well, I hope you did. Uh, actually, it was the music that I used and was allowed to use as the intro music for the first two seasons on this show. It's a bit nostalgic that I'm playing that here today. I did play music by Wendy Rule, and she's the artist who performed that beautiful, beautiful song, which, of course, as an intro, was not played in its full length, just the first minute and a half or so. So I've already played that song somewhere in between in one of those many shows. I don't remember, actually, to be honest, I should have made music notes. I have them all on the website and, of course, in my archives, but I would have to sit down and write down which music I used for 120 episodes. Well, if one of you has enough spare time and wants to do that, thank you. I don't have the time to do it. But um, anyway, I don't think you mind if I play it again because this beautiful song is, well, it's just so nice to hear it again. Think of the day. And when I produced this show and listened to the whole tune here, it was just coming back. Memories of the early episodes. So nice, really. And we're going to go through with Wendy Rule through this episode. There will be a piece by her bit in the middle of the interview, as always, and at the end of the interview, there will be the outro song, Night Sea Journey, also played in its full length, of course. Um, so Wendy Rule will accompany us as it should be for this fifth anniversary. Actually, on that very first episode with Alan Richardson, I also interviewed her in a short interview after Alan to introduce her, who had been so kind to give that music for me that I may use it on the show. Okay, so, um, yeah, much said about music now. And now let's introduce Lionel Snell. But do I really have to introduce? When I announced the show, some of you said, hey, finally Lionel is coming on. And I must say, um, Carl Abrahamson, my co-host today, he... He had the great idea, I must say. Um, he was he. Uh, I asked him if he wanted to do, co-host the show, and he said yes, sure. Uh, who am I going to talk to? And said, well, make a suggestion. And he came up with Lionel Snell, and I have to thank Carl really for that. Not only he was an excellent co-host, but the idea was really great. Lionel, you may also know him under the name of Ramsey Dukes because he used Ramsey Dukes as a lot. Or as, pen, as a pen name for many of his books. But uh, I think he's known by both names. And, well, he is British. He was born in 1945 in Great Britain, but he now lives in South Africa. That's where we spoke to him. And um, he is a mathematician, actually. He, he, but since 72, so for 50 years, he has been writing books on occultism. And, I mean, it's very, very hard to say... Uh, the style they have, because um, there's a lot of humor in those books, at, at the same time, so much wisdom. And you will hear that also in the interview. And he was a forerider in many senses. He was the first person, really, again, to bring Austin Osman Spear into the foreground. Um, Spear Parts was that uh, article in the Agape magazine in 1973. Um, in 1977, Lionel did, uh, we are talking about that in the in the interview, the Abramelin ritual, at least big parts of it. And um, so he was a member of the Ordo Templorientis. He has an own YouTube channel, which you should have a look at. I don't think he produces a lot there anymore, but it's still out there and it's interesting. And he's written many books and just to 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 remember or remind you of one of those books with this strange title S S O T B M E. Does that ring a bell? Uh, of course, my generation it rings a bell. Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed, that means. That's the title of his book, you see, humor. And of course the title is it's a very serious book, but the title is not being taken to be taken completely seriously. Um, and he said he used that title because he says the idea of branding is often more important than the actual product. And that is itself a magical principle of such profundity to almost amount to a definition of magic itself. 
<laughs> well, that is Lionel's all him. And um, well, yes, as I said, many books you you should read, really. Uncle Ramsey's Little Book of Demons, for example, or How to See Fairies, The Hellgate Chronicles. Well, you look it up. It's really great. And I have put, of course, things in the show notes about that. So, Lionel Snell will be our guest today. Enough talking now from me. Let's go and meet him. And in, well, it's not quite in the middle, actually, here today. It will be uh, after 31 minutes, we will break. And the second part of the interview is 45 minutes. So it's quite a bit longer, but who cares? Let's go and meet Lionel Snell and Carl Abrahamson, of course. Here comes the interview. Tonight we have a very special moment. It is a new thing here on the Thought Terrorist podcast. Well, quite new. The second time actually we do that, but I decided after the first to make a series out of that. I like to invite one of my guests who has appeared on the Thought Hermes podcast uh, with me as a as a interview guest to be my partner on this show to be my co-host and it's my great pleasure to have my friend Carl Abrahamson who just recently was here with his great new book on Levee and to be my co-host here today Carl hello good evening good evening Rudolf thank you for having me um, here again and in this wonderful format uh, which we are uh, in which we are privileged to talk to Lionel Snell Absolutely. And you gave it away. It's Lionel Snell, who is our guest here today. I always try to find a guest with my co-host together. So Carl, he suggested to me that we should invite Lionel Snell. And I thought that was a really great idea. Lionel, it's great to have you with us here in the triangle between Sweden, South Africa and Austria. Good evening uh, to you. Hello. Hello. Mm. Well, greetings from deep south, yes. Absolutely. Ne next stop, the Antarctic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So it's great. I mean, Lionel, you're kind of a legend. It's really, uh, I'm really very pleased to have you here and honored to have you. Um, many people, of course, know you also by your pen name, by one of your pen names, but the most famous pen name, I believe, Ramsey Dukes. Um, but um, many of your books have been published under that uh, name. But um, you are much more than an author. You are one of the most active, I believe, um, um, occultist. I don't know what you would like to call yourself, but that might be part of my first question. So um, you are one of those who's, who have who have gone through the Abramelin um, procedure, I might call it. Uh, yeah. One of the very few, maybe the only living who did that. Um, so that might be my first question. We go deeper into your past and your history after that, but um, what incited you to go through that very long, I believe also tedious, complicated procedure? What was your inspiration for that? Yes, I did the six-month version. Um, I know there is, well, uh, I later discovered, you know, there is the 18-month one. And I must say, the six-month one didn't seem long enough. So, <laughs> not that I go to try it again. Um, it was the first sort of serious magic book I came across when I was about 11. Um, I read a review of it which said, you know, in the 50s, there wasn't much magic around. And um, uh, there was just this sort of astrology magazine called Prediction. And in it, there was a review saying, now, this is the real thing. You know, a magical ritual spelt out. It's not one of those that requires the, the tongue of a hangman and all these sort of weird stuff. You know, it's a, it's a, a proper thing. And so I ordered it from the um, Gloucestershire Public Library. And I kept it for a long time. And I was quite sure that as soon as I grew up, I was going to do it. But actually, you know, growing up is not as simple as that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, it was many years later when uh, I got a, after I'd written Sosopomy and published it, I had a message from a stranger saying, uh, would, uh, well, had a project that might interest me. And I met her. And she said, 
um, she wanted to do the Abramelin operation and could I mentor her through it? And I said I couldn't because I hadn't done it myself. So what we decided is we would both do it at the same time in parallel and just keep in contact um, to sort of, you know, and I, I would encourage her or share our discoveries and things like that. So that's what happened. And that was in 1977. And I was live. I, I would have temperamentally, I would have liked to have gone to the deep country away from everyone or gone to the desert to do it. But you soon realize in England that if you turn up in the deep country in the middle of nowhere um, and live like a recluse, you draw attention to yourself. It's weird, you know. I'd get old ladies bringing around cakes for me to eat and things like that, you know. So um, I was living in a, a pleasant suburb and with a big garden. So I made my oratory there and, um, you know, did it. Uh, so I was still a familiar person walking around the village. I didn't draw attention at all, but I was doing this, this operation for six months. And um, it was extraordinary because I, w I went into it with sort of high expectations, you know, of angels in <laughs> appearing. I didn't like to admit that I had those sort of naive expectations, but as the months passed, you realize, you know, that um, I, I, I had that. But it was, um, it was a discipline which was incredibly difficult because it was so simple. You know, mm. just doing things like trying to get up at sunrise, which, I mean, we even worse in Sweden, but it's bad enough in England in this midsummer. You know, you have such a short sleeping time. Things like that. And... Um, uh, but I, I stuck it out and it was like stripping away my illusions and things. It was six months of strengthening. Um, that was really what I was aware of. It was, uh, you need to be strong to face the consequences. And, uh, there was an element of anticlimax because my, my, diaries have been published and um i was quite bitter at the end you know uh, is that all um but i hit a sort of very meaningful silence and i felt that i'd had the knowledge but not the conversation of my holy guardian angel and as often happens with serious magical work my life was in turmoil for several years after that in fact seven years of uh, my life in turmoil and it was only after the end of those seven years which were a bit like this what should have happened in seven days did I have that sense of completion which um, came so much later so it was very powerful for me and it um, changed my life but uh, I never meant to really to publish that diary. It was because later people said, that's a historic document, you know, you should do it. And so, yeah, I've done it. But it was written very much for myself. You know, it's, um, mm. They were certainly right that it was a historical document, yes. Mm. Yeah, calm. Yes, and very valuable too, because uh, it wasn't really uh, contextualized within someone trying to sell something. I'm thinking mm. of, for instance, Crowley and and mm. other people who have always done these things in a sort of semi-public way. In the uh, sense yes. that they have have contextualized it within their own, not just their own soul in a way or identity, mm. but in mm. the context of a group or an order or a teaching mm. or a book yes. that's supposed to, you know, make money for them. And yes. So it is valuable. It's it's mm. like a really uh, an important historical uh, document, but. Mm. I was also curious uh, because, um, well, we, we've known each other for a long time and I have a mm. big, beautiful stack of your books here. And <laughs> it's been very <laughs> interesting to go through them uh, for this conversation. And one of the things that always um, interested me in the beginning and still does is this uh, vivid uh, intellectual uh, theory that you have going on all the time. Mm. It's uh, mm. your um, thinking is very... Uh, I don't know, inspiring in a sense, mm. because it looks at mm. things 
that are otherwise presented as you know fact or wisdom or teaching mm. but you mm. ter- take the stone and you look at it from different perspectives and see what's mm. underneath the stone etc and this, there there are um, early on i think that i defined your or characterized you as being ahead of the times lionel is always ahead of the time because you're <laughs> yeah. writing about things that mm. much later become dominant in culture whether it's li- our little occult uh, yeah. culture whatever yes, you know. yes. Uh, would, would you agree uh, that statement that you are uh, prescient that you're ahead of the times i think so yes i'm i'm fireside i'm an intuitive and um uh Things that seem to me rather obvious, you know, like um, my anticipation that we might live in a virtual reality. Um, I actually first put that in about 1970. Um, I wrote a short story where, um, you know, yeah, we, we were, it, we, everything was explained by the fact that this is a virtual reality. Um, and it was in 1980 where I hit on the idea that actually, if what the scientists are trying to do, which is to um, to find out the theory of everything, the mathematical basis of our, of our, the whole material existence, then um, the only way to test it uh, would be to model it in a computer. And then, you know, how, how could you, where, when would you decide you'd proven it? And really, you would have to run that computer until intelligent beings had evolved in the universe you created, and they themselves worked out what the mathematical formula behind existence was, and they themselves built a simulation, and then they themselves were watching what happened. So in other words, if that material reality is as the scientists say it is, it would create a cascade of virtual worlds. In which case, it's very unlikely we just happen to be in the first one, you know. So it's a sort of logical argument, which um, I think was about sort of 18 years later before someone else came up with that. Um, uh, It had been talked about a bit on the internet, so, you know, word got around. But I never really feel that I own these ideas, you know. I think they were sort of, they were in the ether, and I pick them up. Um, so when people say, oh, you know, good heavens, the matrix is using your idea. Uh, no, it isn't really my idea. It's, it's something that I tuned into, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, a number of things like that are, have been very prescient. Um, mm. Austin I Osman's mean, Spare, for example. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and also uh, Words Made Flesh. Mm. That's oh, uh, yes. here, you know, artificial yeah. intelligence, humanity and the cosmos. You mm. know, this thing... Artificial human, uh, artificial intelligence today is something that we not only have accepted, we we oh, take yes. for granted. It's already integrated in our lives, uh, mm. perhaps to a much wider degree than it's good for us. But well, that's mm. a different topic. Uh, but yeah. but you wrote about these things early on and tried to define mm. them based on mm. your apprehension or understanding at the time. So mm. it's just yes. um, I always felt that was very uh, inspiring to read you because of mm. the fact that um, I might not have understood everything that you were talking about, because you also mm. have a very strict, uh, I would say, scientific mind, a mathematic mm. mind. Uh, mathematic, might, yeah. Di- yes, mm. might be mm. different from someone who comes into the occult, in a way, mm. from an intuitive mm. or from the uh, perspective of myths or symbols or empowerment. Mm. Uh, so, mm. so it's always very refreshing to read your, mm. uh, your essays in your books. Uh, and that said, you yeah. know, if we want to drift into this sort of uh, scientific uh, mm. attitude, uh, mm. we, I guess we always come back to Crowley's original motto or axiom, oh, yes. uh, the method of science, the aim of religion, mm. which was his motto yeah. for the equinox. Yes, uh, and I yes. wondered um, how important that has been for you in your writing specifically. Mm. Well, uh, I always appreciated the uh, precision of Crowley's writing um, uh, and his attention to observation. You know, when you write your diary, um, notice the weather conditions, your moods and and all these elements. And that was one of the things I respected about the very early, um, you know, books like Agrippa and that was 
uh, in the 50s, people saying, well, that's all nonsense. You know, they're sort of soft-headed and that sort of thing. But the actual, the observations were so accurate, so precise, so clear. And in a way, they were observing better than scientists because scientists would only observe the matter. They wouldn't observe their own feelings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the alchemists were doing both which actually is, is a more perceptive uh, rather than saying some things we mustn't look at. Um, so I always respected that. And Crowley um, was, was very much in, the, in that mold. You know, he he um, paid great attention to detail. I myself don't really accept the method of science, the aim of religion, because one of the things that I've always argued for is that Science does its own thing very well, but it isn't the only way of looking at the world, the only way of addressing the world. There's an artistic way, a religious way, a magical way, for, for instance. And um, I've long been a member of a thing called the Scientific and Medical Network. Now, their sort of main thrust is that science is wonderful, but we also believe in spirit so we want science to extend to be a science of spirit. And my own feeling is, oh, no, no, no. Leo, let science get on with what it's really good at. I just would like the scientists to recognize there are other ways of looking at the world which are more suitable for other things like art and magic and religion. So really, that was always my approach to it. Because I've, I've always maintained that uh, the way you address the world, um, your viewpoint actually affects how the world responds to you. And so I feel there's much more to explore. And I think of my writing really as exploration as much as anything. I'm not really being dogmatic about anything. I'm saying, think about this, try this. Yeah. Um, mm. Now, Lionel, I have a question. How... Did you become the Lionel still the, that you are today? I mean, you, you're uh, telling us, uh, uh, inspired by cult questions about how you um, found that path and how you developed it. But where did it all start? Where mm. in your life did you realize there is something out there that is um, special and maybe not everyone uh, works with or discovers? And, uh, well, how did that start in your life? Well, I was born in the deep country and bred up, uh, bred in the deep country. And um, so I always had a sense of nature and the cycles. You know, we, we didn't have electricity uh, in my house where I was brought up. And so I was very much aware of the cycles of day and night and the moon and things like that. So uh, very much, um, uh, yes, in that sort of fits the pagan sensibility. Now, um, I I think all children are interested in magic to a certain point. Um, there's a book called Magic and the Mind by Eugene Sabotin that um, uh, he explores how young children accept magical ideas. And then around about the age of six, they begin to realize that they're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the 1950s, it was very much more skeptical than people are now, actually. And um, so when I went to school, it was an education which said magic is absolute nonsense. There's nothing there. Now, I, my school had a most, the science library had a fantastic collection of books on magic and alchemy. Um, one of the um, previous uh, heads of science had been the man who wrote the Penguin History of Alchemy, and um, he left his books. So here were books like, you know, old leather-bound first editions of Agrippa and um, Paracelsus, and even going back to um, uh, books in Arabic that, you know, that I couldn't read, but um, Thomas Vaughan, all these people. And I could take them home for the holidays and everything. And um, so... My question was, but if magic is nothing, it's never existed, why so much written about it? Why do people talk about it so much? And the answer 
I was given was, well, you see, primitive people are brought up in a culture which believes there are spirits and ghosts and things like that. And so they're sort of brainwashed and therefore they'll see them. And I think it's a mathematical sense of balance. I said, oh, so in our culture, where we're told there are no ghosts, there are no fairies, um, no spirits, uh, we wouldn't be able to see them whether they're there or not, would we? And um, I had a demonstration of that very clearly when I was at university at Cambridge, where I saw a ghost. Um, I woke up in the night and there over the bed was someone with a dagger, a snarling face, angry face with a dagger. And I just stared at it. And um, it was very clear, you know, I could see it absolutely clearly. And as I stared, it sort of faded into a swirly curtain at the back. And so the obvious thing to think was, oh yes, it was the swirly curtain and my brain sort of like an optical illusion saw this figure. But the thing was, those optical illusions, you can go to and from them. You know the sort of the picture which looks like an old woman, an old crone, and then it looks like a very young girl. Once you see the trick, you can go between them from one to the other. Well, I looked at that, I kept my eyes on that curtain and I couldn't see the image. It would not come back. And so I realized what I'd experienced was not just flipping an optical illusion, it was censorship. My brain has censored the ghost and got rid of it. And so that sort of confirmed this feeling I had that, um, you know, our culture doesn't actually let us experience magic and it will make us very conscious where we try to think of to explain it away. It's a defensive thing. Right. But is that what mm. you're touching upon in uh, My Year of Magical Thinking, which is your latest and super fantastic book? Because you, mm. in that book, you write that, you know, the relationship between what you call serious publishing culture and mm. uh, that there's a relationship between that and the dumbing down uh, of curiosity. Mm. And that that's yeah. actually the fact that has brought on this rise in magical thinking that we can see, mm. for instance, in, in the occulture. Um, mm. Is that the same thing, you would say? Yes, it is. It's a sort of extension of that. Um, it's like a pendulum see, what, swinging back and forth. Mm, yeah. And I think actually there's, there's this, uh, I have this image of, you know, the, the beach and the waves coming and going. And so you get sort of fashions, you know, like there was the um, Victorian magical revival. And then there was the 60s magical revival. And I think we're having a magical revival now. Now, to me, that's like the waves coming in and out. But there's also a tide, a slower movement. And I think we're on that tide, which is actually we're moving towards magical thinking um, on a much bigger scale. Uh, and there will be, it'll come and go. I'm sure in about 10 years time, people will be laughing at the sort of 20s magical gullibility or something. But they were still moving in that direction. You know, that... Um, it's interesting, the thing about, you see, when I was at school... I was a mathematician rather than a, a scientist. And um, this example I've, I've given was uh, the maths master came in and wrote on the blackboard at the beginning of a lesson, let I be such that I squared equals minus one. And he had a revolution on his, on his hands because we said, there's no such thing. You can't have a square root of a minus number, you know. Um, and, and we argued with him and argued with him, you know. and, and um, he said, well, think of it as another dimension. Well, where is that dimension? You know, sort of, <laughs> um, now, he said, the trouble is um, you are, he wouldn't say corrupted, but you're under the influence of what he called the folklore section, which was physics. Um, they've got this superstitious awe about what's real and what isn't. Now, um, let's just... Uh, act as if it was true, you know, act as if, the Austin Spare thing. Um, let's say that I squared equals minus one, and we'll do the algebra. And the algebra worked. 
you know, it's perfectly valid algebra. Um, and the interesting thing, though, of course, is that those imaginary numbers became the basis of most modern science, you know, a a electricity theory depended on things like that. So there was the thing that there was something which was imaginary and despised, and we, we didn't want to, to have anything to do with it. And yet we learned so much from it. And I couldn't help comparing that with, um, say, the people at Findhorn, who went about their gardening and their life as if there were fairies and devas, and they could talk to them and converse with them. And they got good results. And other people say, but there are no fairies, no devas. But they acted as if there were, and they got good results. And so um, mathematical thinking uh, is closer to magical thinking in a way, because it isn't hampered by this thing of, oh, we can't look at that because it isn't real. Or um, mm -hmm. if we look at that, we won't get published in, the, um, in nature because they'll think we're cranks, you know, a sort of censorship. And um, yeah. But isn't it also true that, that uh, these past hundred years, uh, I was thinking with Einstein and the theory of uh, mm. relativity and uh, then the huge magical resurgence uh, or revival, uh, Sort of, and also science fiction. All of these things mm. have merged and gelled and, and cross fertilized in a very fascinating mm. way that's sort of unprecedented. It hasn't really happened before in, in human culture in the same way. Uh, so, this seems to be a kind of malleability of a certain mm. kind of intellectual uh, analysis of these things. And I'm mm. again returning to uh, a quote from you here. Uh, you wrote in the ma uh, Magical Thinking book, magic can take a scientific proven truth, call it a workable myth, and use mm. it as such. Mm. Uh, can you see any similar things going on, for instance, in mathematics? I mean, an increased openness towards mm. different ways of looking at things. Mm. Well, um, the math, one of our math masters said that something similar happened in Greek times. In the, in the classic period, that was a time, again, of supreme rationality. And um, uh, the mathematicians showed that the atomistic universe was, not cons was something missing from it. And they discovered irrational numbers. And it turns out irrational numbers are vastly outnumber ordinary numbers, real numbers, you know. So that, they, that he said was a crack in that uh, perfect rational world that they were creating of atoms and um, rational calculations. And I saw that as leading to, you know, the post-classical time, the Roman era, when there was a huge resurgence of, um, uh, you know, alternative medicine, Mm -hmm. Astronomy became astrology. Uh, metallurgy became alchemy. People tend to say that, you know, chemistry came out of alchemy when it got sophisticated. But actually, um, the chemistry of the time, the metallurgy, making gold was became politically so important that uh, it had to be secret. And if you make... If you don't share ideas in science, if you start to impose secrecy, science becomes a bit weird. And you saw that in Nazi Germany, where, you know, they threw out all the um, Jewish scientists and they began to form theories of fire and ice and, you know, hollow earths and things like that. And in the Cold War, you had all these stories about mysterious things being found out in, in um, laboratories in the Iron Curtain. And then you have the... Um, uh, the, the, these American secret services and the men who stared at goats, you know, people try. So um, science begins to crack up if you, if you force it into secrecy. And they've got that pressure on them now because, of course, commercially, there's a lot of reason to. So uh, people always quote the fact that science is becoming more mysterious, you know, with quantum physics and things like that. But it's also, um, unless they can keep up that free flow of sharing ideas, science will begin to splinter, I think, and get weirder. 
And you can see the signs of that happening in, in some of the sort of cultish science things. Yeah, that, um, can that potentially be a good thing? It's an interesting thing, yes. Um, I think it's good in the sense that what is uh, part of the problem of scientism, we'll call it that, you know, the sort of naive science, is that it tells you what you can't look at. I think, you know, imagine one of those sort of um, a typical uh, double blind test for a drug, you know, a thousand randomly selected people. Um, some people are given the placebo, others are given the drug, and even the doctors who give it don't know which they're giving. Now, I feel it's one of the people on that team who's organizing that. And they, they said, let's look at the sex, let's look at the background, the age, we'll look at all these different factors, you know, uh, um, to, and if someone said, well, how about looking at the moon sign? There would be a sort of shocked silence and <laughs> no, <laughs> pretty, very easy to look at the moon sign. No, no, no. It'll never get published in the Lancet if we do something like that. You know, we'll be outlawed. Um, so this, that sort of scientific viewpoint, the scientism tells you what you mustn't look at. And that again, as you see why I so much respect Crowley and those old um, magicians, they would look at everything. Mm -hmm. And If you, you could say there was a golden age of science, which was sort of end of Victorian to, to the early 20th century, the really big things like electricity, um, quantum, relativity, huge discoveries were made. And really now we're just sort of filling in the details, really, compared with that. Now, in that golden age of science, they looked at everything. They studied phrenology. They decided, you know, there was a psychical research society. They looked at life after death. Um, they looked at eugenics, all sorts of things. Now, in many cases, they came to negative conclusions, but they looked at them. They really were open to trying everything. And I think that was part of why it was a golden age of science. You know, there was that really questing spirit. And I think that um, the sort of the scientism of today squashes that. You know, if you're going to get published, you mustn't mention that. You mustn't look at that. You mustn't look in that direction. And um, yeah. Isms, so. <laughs> isms are always dangerous moments when yeah. you create yeah. isms of anything. Absolutely. Yeah. It's actually <laughs> a, you, a cult. You said, cult. <laughs> yes, exactly. I did not promise too much, did I? Okay. And uh, now let's uh, go and listen to some more music. Um, This will be a long block now because we will have a song called Let the Wind Blow, which is about six minutes long by the great Wendy Rule. I just love that voice. Um, and after that, after that, we will go to a 46 sec minute second part of the interview. But you will see that time flies because um, Lionel is, I, I mean, you just have to really hold on to follow his thought but in a positive way because it's so intelligent what he has to say and interesting and and funny at the same time it's just he's just a great guy and after which uh, as promised night sea journey again from wendy rule that song that was the outro song for the first two seasons in the thoughts harvest podcast and while i say that i have to thank once again chris roberts from the uk who has then written a special intro and outro music for this show and who, by the way also did that again for keiko but radio that little jingle uh, is at my request written by him and um, i'm very happy about that but um, nevertheless it's nice to hear wendy will's music back um, after Night Sea Journey. I will briefly, just briefly come back. It's not a regular episode where I have to tell you many things about the future. It's just to say goodbye to you. And um, well, let's go and listen to Wendy Rule's Let the Wind Blow and then back to Lionel Snell. <laughs> No holding back We both have feathers 
eyes of black Wings wide and true
you said um, you feel like there is a magical revival going on now. Um, I would be interested to hear you a bit more on that. Um, what makes you say that and what are for you the signs that this magical revival if we said if we compare it to the one late 19th century or the one maybe in the 70s 80s um, yeah. how would you see it today and how does it compare to those previous big historic ones we know so far well this is like the little waves um when i say we're magical revival now as it was in the 60s um if you think of the sort of the I call it the craze, the fashion of about 2000, up to 2010, where um, people like Richard Dawkins um, would be filling, uh, filling an auditorium packed full to hear him talk. And um, he had a series on television called The Enemies of Reason, where he attacked um, clairvoyance and things like that. Now, the decline of that movement is very apparent um you know the, the sort of the graph of um the website going people going to his website it really tailed off i don't know about um i, can't remember, I think it's about sort of 2010 2012 that sort of time which is rather interesting because it's about the time when pluto entered capricorn and liz green said that Uh, Capricorn, of course, represents many things, you know, like government structure and things like that. But she said at a subtle level, it is our sense of what is real. It's the grounding of our sense of reality. And Pluto entering it will erode that. And I'd be very much aware the extent to which is that, that is true. Um, I mean... It has many manifestations, some of the very negative, you know, like fake news and things like that. Now, um, I was listening to a whole discussion about uh, conspiracy theories and fake news at lunchtime. Now, um, there's a lot which makes people feel very despairing about that. But I think that where people are waking up to the fact that you need other criteria for judging. Um, people, there used to be uh, beauty, truth, and goodness. You know, the good, the beautiful, true. A really rich set of parameters for making decisions about your life. The Protestants um, downgraded beauty. Oh, it's just worldly indulgence. You know, it's fleshly nonsense this is the good and the true and then they squash those two together the only thing that is good is the truth now so we left with only one criterion truth is it true or is it not true and that became a binary thing a fact is either true or it is not true now that's a very coarse way of judging the world um, if you think of um you see Even if you just had truth, is a Shakespeare play true? Of course it isn't. Historically, it's, it's totally wrong. It's just actors pretending to be people. It's absolute falsehood. But the, what it says about human nature, it carries an incredible amount of truth in it. So is it true or is it not true? It just doesn't work, that binary distinction. And this is partly why people are very gullible now. You see, if you if you don't like what Trump is saying, all the critics do is to say what he's saying isn't true. And they produce a mass of facts to show it isn't true. But if you have decided it is true, you're committed. And so if um, the world begins to go bad under his leadership, it can't be because he was wrong, because what he said was true. It must be because he's been sabotaged by nasty enemies. You see, people continue because they're locked into that idea of truth. Now, I think it would be a good thing if people began to realize that so much information is coming in. 
how the hell are you going to judge what's true and what isn't? You know, you can spend all your lifetime researching one fact to see where it came from. You have actually to look within and say, does this work for me? In the way a piece of mathematics, as a, as a mind experiment, a thought experiment, you know, does this make sense? How do I feel about this? And I think that um, uh, faced with such a confusion of ideologies and things, I think turning in and observing how your soul responds to it is a way forward, which we may be having to learn. People may have to start doing this themselves and not just, you know, absorbing what comes in. So, um, yeah, I see hope in some of these changes, which other people see nothing but despair in, um, these trends. Mm -hmm. That's great. And also, when, when you uh, said that, it sort of... Uh it brings back memories from or sort of echoes from th that very formative time when uh, you sort of came out with your books and stuff. I'm thinking of the, the chaos magic uh, mm. environment, if you can call it an environment, uh, which mm. had that super pragmatism. Uh, mm. It was uh, selfishly pragmatic and pragmatically selfish, but it was in some kind of altruistic uh, on pioneering, perhaps even scientific mm. way of finding mm. things out. What works? I'll take this and that and put it in my little uh, stew and see what comes out of it. Uh, mm. Pragmatism, simply. And I think mm. uh, you have been one of the most uh, consistent uh, theoreticians uh, of that mm. in your writings. I'm very mm. curious, going back to that time, was there ever then a kind of a homogenous environment between people like you and Pete Carroll and Sherwin and all of those people who were active and writing about this, this attitude mm. towards magic or towards life? Mm. Mm. Um, I would again say it was a buzz in the air because uh, um, I heard about Gerald Suster who was giving a talks. There was a... a someone set up a sort of school of interesting esoteric ideas, things in North London. And there was this person who was giving talks on the tarot. And I was interested because he'd been at Cambridge about the same time as I had. And I thought, oh, I wonder if he would be interested in the book I just published, SSOTBME. So I went down and met him and gave him a copy. And he was the one who said, this is the book that put the magic back in magic, in the sense that it's saying that magic can actually make things happen. It's not just a psychological um, approach to life. And um, he introduced me to Pete Carroll and my ideas to Pete Carroll. And then that um, connected me to the chaos magic current, which was forming. Now, I was never much of a joiner. And I was never a person who actually could establish a scene or a movement. I mean, Pete Carroll came up with Chaos magic uh, with Sherman and, and people like that. Chaos magic is an idea and creating the IOT and really setting a movement going. I wasn't really in a position to do that. I was putting out ideas and it was like throwing fertilizer on the ground, you know, and it helped these things to spring up. I was the first person who really wrote up Austin Spare seriously. Um, Kenneth Grant had done the Carfax monograph, but I wrote the thing called Spare Parts, which was an analysis of the Book of Pleasure, which really is his most magical work. And, um, uh, and that got published by Sorcerer's Apprentice. And so, um, yeah, I was putting out ideas which were f fertilized the whole movement, I think. Um, but I was never a driver in that movement in the way that Pete and Ray and the others were. Uh, that was very interesting to hear um, before I disappeared. Uh, sometimes I feel uh, a, a kinship, a sort of kinship between you and uh, Robert Anton Wilson. Mm. You know, there's a you know, sharp intelligence. There is a, basically a kind of proto-scientific mm. thinking. There's an openness, a pragmatism, and it's also a great sense of mm. humor. Uh, <laughs> although... He's an American. Yeah. Can can you at least f feel this? Yes. To some degree? Well, it's very strange because I I don't I haven't followed him very much, but 
it was the book Illuminatus, the three volumes of Illuminatus, which um, really turned me on. And the strange thing is that he must have written that, I think, in the late 60s, because it came out early 70s. Well, I wrote the book I wrote called, you know, Johnson's 20th Century Occult Philosopher and Skeptical Politic Theorist was three volumes and I was writing it at the same time. And when I read Illuminatus, I said, yes. <laughs> you know, I just felt it was the same current. And um, uh, I just sort of related to it so much. And then uh, the, uh, the German and the Austrian chaos magicians, several times they'd said, um, Ramsey Jukes is sort of like the European Robert Anton Wilson. Um, and another one said, um, he's Robert Hamilton Wilson, but speaking with an English accent sort of thing. And so they drew that thing very much. Um, now, I, uh, so I, I love those books. And I did see him once talking in London, which must have been about 1980. And I must say, I was a bit disappointed because at that stage, he didn't seem to have gone forward very much. You know, what he was saying was very much like what he'd said back at Illuminatus. So I didn't, and, and one or two of the other people who were with me agreed. They said, um, you know, he's sort of on a pause at present. Uh, so I never really followed up. I, I know that he's a very interesting thinker. And um, if I had another lifetime, I would, I would read many more books, including more of his books, I think. Yeah. Mm. One of the reasons I started this this podcast about five years ago was that my idea was I must do something for the European scene, meaning also Central European scene and, of uh, yeah. course, the UK, because mm. it's great that North America has taken over so much of that of that current and, mm. of course, together with the UK. But Central Europe, where I'm from, has been a bit at the source maybe a few hundred years ago of all of that yes. um, yeah. do you and you just mentioned my compatriots recognizing you as Robert Anton Wilson of Europe which I believe is a great comparison I'm proud about my compatriots <laughs> here but um, why do you think has what has caused that shift towards the English speaking countries is it the Protestantism maybe you just mentioned before or what has caused that shift um, from Central Europe to the West in observing magic in producing new work I mean, I'm generalizing here I'm aware of that but it, it, it is a movement that I sense very clearly it's almost like a sort of um a flowering bush that's got its roots in uh, further east, I think. Um, I, uh, I'm not a linguist, so I don't know other languages very well. But um, I had a very interesting contact from, from uh, Czechoslovakia. Some of the most intelligent sort of uh, discussions I had with him. And when I visited um, Prague, um, he came and met me, and we had a fantastic connection there. And there's a marvelous um, publishing company, um, which I hoped was doing so sop for me, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, that, that republishes our rare alchemical works from the private libraries of Czechoslovakia. So um, I'm aware of like sort of roots going further east, um, and. I suppose I could think of other examples, you know, that uh, Gurdjieff, Madame Blavatsky, um, coming from that way. But they seem to sort of break into flower as they cross over to England and then to, um, you know, across the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, you could be cynical and say, well, that's just flowering. That's just show, you know. <laughs> It's not as deep, but it's quite interesting. I just thought of that, you know, that um, uh, I think that they flow that way. Actually, the whole thing of sort of um, the mysteries of the East going a bit further, um, Eastern philosophies, things like that, I mean, uh, which, which launched the hippie thing and the, the um, beatniks, you know, Zen and things like that. It seems as though ideas flow in that direction around the world. Um, mm -hmm. That... Um, Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Couldn't it also have to do with uh, just general 
um, culture flowing in a kind of imperialistic way, mm. depending on which medium brings it forward. Mm. I mean, we have been, uh, say, from the 1930s and onwards, very, very imbued with American films mm. and also British films, meaning English language films because of the medium mm. of film. Uh, and now I think it's just the internet has sort of dissolved this. There's a greater possibility of, of disseminating oh, things yeah. from different cultures, mm. like with immediate impact. Mm. So I think it's uh, maybe it's a remnant, because I think you also mentioned that, I think it's in the most recent book, that a lot of the occult revival that became dominant mm. was British in essence. Mm. You know, you had the Golden Dawn, oh, yes. and you had Crowley, you had mm. Dion Fortune, mm. and all of these things, and then Grant, and et cetera, mm. et cetera, uh, from this, what you call, little island, <laughs> yeah. or whatever, however you describe mm. it, from a fairly small uh, country. Mm. Uh, but that, I think, is, in a way, a, a tradition of uh, benevolent cultural imperialism, mm. in a way, bringing intellectual thought and fodder for the mm. mind and soul, out into the yes, world. It's just yes. a tradition, basically. I, I think one of the things and, and, one of the yeah. things I suggested in that book was that something about the English language um, makes it rather good for magic. And I think it was that um, uh, there is well, English and Chinese are languages which don't have um, very rigid grammatical laws. And I, I had a neighbor who was a Sinologist, and he would show that, he said, the nearest thing to Chinese in English is newspaper headlines. And he used to give the example, um, labor call for death penalty suspension. Now, he said, that sounds like uh, they're asking to recruit people to be hangmen. <laughs> a labor call for the suspension of death penalty, yeah. yeah? But but we all know that labor means a labor party, um, and suspending the death penalty means not hanging people, it means stopping it. But how looking at that sentence is as bad as a, as a Chinese haiku in terms of it's just a set of words, and you have to have the context. You have to have the whole thing in order to make sense of it. Otherwise, it's really just a crazy statement. Um, and um, uh, English language, because it's sort of it's, it's taken in the um, Romance languages, is taken in the Nordic languages and the Germanic languages. There are so many synonyms for things that. Um, uh, instead of being precise, they have clouds of meaning and associations. So it's almost a sort of an ideal divination language in a way. Um, you know, um, some people, I think I gave the example in the book that people could tell your social class from whether you say lounge or sitting room or drawing room for the same thing. <laughs> they can tell you about your background and all sort of thing just from that. So um, I think the English language is actually very appropriate for magic. It rather encourages magical thinking because of this sort of uh, um, complexity. It's complexity, really. Um, but uh, I think that's only sort of one factor, but it, it's one that may be significant. It may it's be. an interesting, it's an interesting way to look at it. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I never heard that. And it's absolutely yeah. true. When you call an American switchboard, they'd say the line is busy and you call us an, en an English switchboard, they'd say the extension is engaged. You know, that's all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Extensions engaged. Engaged sounds almost, almost sort of phallic, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rich with meaning, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. And on that tangent of, of rich in meaning and, and words in general, uh, here are a couple of your book titles. You know them mm. well, but this, this is for the listeners. Blast your way to megabucks with my secret sex power formula. Thunder squeak. <laughs> Sex Secrets of the Black Six Magicians Post. Post, and What I Did my in holidays. My Holidays, Essays on Black Magic, Satanism, Devil Worship, and Other Niceties. <laughs> so the question is, mm. uh, do you come up with the book titles uh, before you write the book or after you have written the book? All right. Thunder Squeak. Um, 
I think Thunder Squeak, uh, the first thing I wrote, the book that wasn't published, you know, the, um, I was very much aware of this. this te- I, uh, I could put it in terms of my sun sign is Aries, my rising sign is um, uh, Capricorn. So my ruling planets are Mars and Saturn. Uh, the caution of Saturn, the sort of um, playing safe and the wildness of Aries. And there's a tension in me, which in Thunder Squeak was Liz Angerford and Ambrose Lee, you know. Um, and uh, so I think I came up with Thunder Squeak, uh, certainly while I was writing it, but not afterwards. Um, funny enough, the um, Blast Your Way to Megabucks. Um, the secret of that will be out because I've just published the works of um, Hugo Lestrange. And one of the hey. many characters <laughs> in it is the very irreverent Dr. Evil Be My Good. And in one of his rants, he's flogging his book, which is called Blast Your Way to Megabucks by Secret Sex Power Formula. And I had to put a footnote saying Ramsey Duke stole this title and was cursed forevermore because of that. You know, so uh, so that that I just love that title and I had it in my mind, you know, um, I thought so stop for me. Well, that was a very sort of uh, 1970s joke because this was the hippie era, era, the time of um, uh, Whole Earth Catalog, um, I, International T- Times Magazine, um, all that sort of thing. And uh, people were writing little little uh, hand-printed books um, on radical ideas. And someone wrote a book about the theory of... of um, Broadcasting, you know, television, um, rather sort of McLuhan inspired book. And he called it Sex and Television. Not there was anything about sex in it. It's just, you know, (laughs) playing the game of shoving that in in order to put it in the title. And that really was my thinking when Sex Secrets of Black Magician Exposed. I thought if I had that title, they'd want to publish it. Um, but I can't face putting it out there. So I put it as initials, you know. So uh, (laughs) So it was a sort of joke yeah. mm. <laughs> but but you're right nowadays it's the it's the publishers often who create those titles <laughs> but back at the time you could you could yeah. it yourself to make it happen. yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, what do you think will you know we talked about the interaction between the scientific discourse mm. and, and magical thinking and all these things. And of course, they will always cross fertilize and be mm. in, the same, in the same arena in a way, it's simply the human arena. Mm. But I'm, I'm curious what you think um, that a future, m- specifically magical discourse, will consist mm. of. Well, um, there's a sort of a bit of a long story here, which shall I try it out on you? Um, this yeah. idea of, um, you know, the way you look at the world affects what you get out of the world. Um, and I give the example of what happens if um, you have a run of extraordinary or surprising uh, synchronicities. And, you know, it's the 17th of the month and your daughter's 17 years old today. And uh, you go shopping and the bill comes to 17 pounds and you're in a hurry to get back and you find it's a number 17 bus. Um, now, how do people react to that? A very common idea is, well, that's a load of nonsense. It's nothing, no significance. Um, you see so many numbers every day. The fact that just four of them happen to be 17, forget it. Another person might say, and I think more magical thinker, 17, my daughter's 17 today. What is the essence of 17? Uh, I think I'm going to go and go back this afternoon. I'm going to read the 17th tarot card and perhaps look at the 17th E King and look at it numerologically. What is that thing about 17 that's so special, makes it different from 16, 18, you know, and so sets out on a sort of exploration, magical exploration for meaning. Someone else just sees a good story there, 
you know, there's a drama here. Uh, there's a storyline. 17, 17, 17. More 17 is the better. So I'm going to have a, a birthday party for her and I'll have balloons with 17 on them and I'll play the Beatles. She was just 17. And I'll have 17 candles on the cake and I'll tell them about this remarkable 17s that happened today while it's cut. Give them something to remember, something a bit special, a little drama. Another person who's religious might say, when we get home, I'm going to read the 17th Psalm with my daughter and we'll pray on it. And let's make a tradition out of that. You know, that every birthday, we'll read the Psalm of our age and, and pray and like that. Now, you see, I would say that those last three are having a richer experience. Um, nothing big. I mean, you don't win a, a, a drama award for your little um, party you've held. Um, uh, I doubt if the person who reads up the 17th tarot is really going to find the secrets of the universe. But you'd have to be pretty stupid not to get something out of an afternoon spent researching like that. Now, if I tell the first person that they had a richer experience, he would say, rubbish. You know, they wasted their time on childish games and a superstitious nonsense from the past. I went back to work and I earned enough money to buy my daughter a laptop. You know, <laughs> how do, can you possibly say it was richer? Now, the thing is that that point of view, which is so confident, tries to explain away the other ways of thinking. Um, now, it, it, say in my time in the 50s, they would just say, well, it's nonsense and nothing, you know, it's all a load of rubbish. But now they admit that actually um, even grown-up people do a bit of magical thinking. And even grown-up people can get into a religious further and fight for their country and, and blow themselves up, things like that, you know. So they admit there's something there, but they've got to explain it away, and they fall back on social Darwinism. Now, the magical thinking which says you believe you can do something that's impossible that could kill a lot of people. So it doesn't work with the ordinary Darwin, you know, survival of the fittest model. But if you think of a species that believes it can do impossible things, you've got a very dynamic species that's going to go out and conquer the world, you know, even if many of them die in the process. So they justify it in Darwin's terms. The idea of sublime beauty, which goes beyond words, is a tremendous stimulus to the sexual reproductive instinct. You know, people who would cross the desert for a loved one or go to war because of the Helen of Troy and things like that. And of course, the prime example is religion. If you've got such a peck mentality that you could give your life for your tribe or your whatever, you know, that gives you tremendous power. And so they will explain away that these are primitive things that the brain has evolved to do, human brain over, over thousands of years. And but now we know the truth. Um, these things are built into us, but now we know we must overcome them because we now know that the world is made of objects and nouns and verbs, objects and actions, and you can repeat them and you can show the Now, you see, of that explanation, what strikes me is this, I don't see this final view as the ultimate achievement. It's actually the beginning point because my cat believes in a material universe. There's a tree, there's a cat, and there's a dog. The dog barks and the cat leaps into the tree. It doesn't touch the tree to see if it's real. It doesn't speak to the tree and ask its permission to jump into it. It just sees the world in terms of objects and actions. A solid tree, me, the cat, the, act, the agent, the dog, danger. Now, um, so I think a brain is something which gives you that sensory user interface. A, a butterfly landing on a flower expects it to be there and solid and to have nectar in it. So the butterfly is a materialist. You know, all creatures are materialists. It's humans that have taken to looking at the world in other ways, like magically or artistically. Yeah. Now, I see that in, um, in, the, 
the growth of thinking of a baby. A newborn baby will reach for the spoon, look at it, and pick it up, and keep doing that. It's doing proto-science. It's recognizing that there is a world made of solid objects, which you can repeat, and they will do the same thing. Push it to the edge of the table, and it falls down. And it always does that. You do it again and again, drives the parents mad, pushing things to the edge of the table. And you're getting proto-explanations. It's like proto-science. Um, why does it f drop off the edge of the table? Because everything drops to the floor when you push it to the edge of the table. Now, what happens is you then have greater complexity. Mother is predictable. She'll come and pick it back and put it back. But not so predictable. Sometimes she's a bit slow about putting it back. Sometimes she's a bit bolshy and doesn't do it. And now this is the beginning of magical thinking. What if there's a mind outside my own head? If my mother has a mind like mine, it doesn't explain in the way that the scientific experiment does, but it gives me an understanding of why she might behave that way. And this is the beginning is for me of, of, of magical thinking, because if the mind is out there, then perhaps there's a mind in the dog, in the cat, in the tree, in the weather. And so when, for instance, the market trader looks at all his screens and says, the markets are really nervous today, that isn't a scientific uh, statement which allows you to predict exactly what's going to happen next. But it gives you a sort of understanding of the mood of the market, which can help you to make good decisions. And that is magical thinking spreading even into adulthood. Um, uh, people who talk to their cars, you know, come on, come on, come on, don't, don't stop on me now, don't stop on me now. Um, you know, uh, so magical thinking, I see, is more sophisticated than that materialist view. And um, I see... Uh, another brain that has developed in a similar way, and that is the computer. A computer nowadays is not, for most people, is not an elaborate thing where you have to know the programming language or things like that. A computer is what you could give to an 11-year-old schoolgirl or boy. And if you say to them, what is this? They open up and there's a desktop. What's that? That's my school homework. It just looks like a little rectangle to me. Click and it opens. There, what I did in my holidays. That's what I've written. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, well, what about this one? This one says homework. Ah, oh, no, that's a folder. A folder? Yes, I can take this um, essay and I can slide it over into the folder. But it's vanished. No, no, I can open the folder and it's in there. <laughs> but is it the same essay that was there? Yes. Same. Oh, look, open it up. It's the same essay. It's just moved it across into the folder. So it presents you with a world of objects and actions. It's a graphical user interface, not a full sensory user interface, but it's getting there. Now, so I say, so, so this is real. These things, that really is a document there. Um, uh, what about that one? Is it the same? No, 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 that's my maths homework. It's quite different, not connected at all. Oh, and that's the school, the class timetable. They're all quite different. But they're real. Oh, yes. And then a, a programmer goes past and says, that's not real. Let me show you what's really happening. And he switches on the um, sort of uh, terminal mode or whatever it's called, you know, the... Um, uh, and there is a stream of language and symbols and things going down and down and down. He said, that's what's really happening. You were just given a sensory user interface. So to help you to work. And that is what our brains have given. Every creature has been given that. Say. And so you say, wow, so this language stuff, this is what's real, is it? And he says, yes, this is the reality behind that. But then... Uh, a machine coder comes along and says, no, that isn't real. Let me show you what's real. And he shows a whole page full of noughts and ones. Nothing but zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. He says, that language was just a development so that the human brain could cope with it a bit better. Um, 
And so this is what's real, the noughts and ones. But then a hardware engineer comes past and say, no, 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 those noughts and ones are just symbolic representations of two states of silicon, charged and not charged. That is what is real. Now, interestingly, you see, they've, they've gone up the tree of life. The unmanifest is a piece of silicon which has got no charge to it. As soon as you put charges, you have manifestation. Ketha, the top of the tree of life. You have naught and one, naught and one. You have yin and yang. And out of that, you have then the 10 sephiroth and the 22 paths. You've got the numbers and you've got the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Language and everything tumbles out of that. And then the fall is to Malkuth, the world of solid objects, the material world. And you had all those levels on the computer. So I would say going back to the people who, you know, with their, with their remarkable synchronicity of 17, the, um, the materialist is the person who's working on the sensory user interface and he thinks that all there is. The magician is the person who suspects that there may be some meaning linking these things. You know, they may be connected in a subtle way and he's trying to reach to find that. The artist actually says, no, it goes, what I'm seeking goes beyond words. It can't be described. There's an essence there which is very simple and I'm reaching towards it. And he's really at the um, machine coding level. And then the religious person says, you know, this whole world is an illusion. It's actually reality lies outside, it completely unmanifest to us. So, you see, I, I see it as sort of a ladder going up. And I think that um, as our brains evolved, these more complex going up towards abstraction, um, we are beginning to bring these things into our lives. You know, it's a long journey, but it's like going back up the tree of life. Um, and there's a hell of a lot to explore up there. And uh, yeah, I mean, for instance, the, um, on that desktop, those things which they said were totally different, there's no connection between them. You know, that's this class timetable. That's what I wrote as an essay. That's some maths homework. That's something my dad downloaded. They all got docx written on them. So doesn't that mean they're connected in some way? Of course, at the programming level, they are, because they're all Word documents. And there's a huge lot of verbiage which makes them into Word documents. They are connected, even though they're seen as being totally independent and separate. And so when, um, uh, say, a young man who's got women troubles decides to light a candle and meditate on the moon and, um, uh, you know, to find a way of sort of understanding womanhood in that. The skeptic says, but the moon is a piece of rock, you know, a million miles away or whatever. It's got nothing to do with women. There's no connection there at all. It's totally ridiculous. But actually, we all live in a virtual reality created by our own brains. When the person thumps the table and says, this is what I call real, he experiences that thump in the table, the reality. But actually, the reality is electrical currents going up his arm into the brain and visual sight of his thin, um, electrical currents. And the brain models that into an experience, a graphical, a, a sensory user experience of thumping the table and saying, this is what I call real. But it's all modeled in the brain. It's a virtual reality. Now, that person who says the moon is a lump of rock out there and women are nothing connection to it. Everything we know about the moon and everything we've ever experienced about women is in our brain in this little bit of stuff. And to believe that there's a totally separate set of neurons dealing with one from the other and there's no connection between them is totally ludicrous. Um, it's all like that programming language. It's all a flow on that other level. And I think that someone who takes a, a psychedelic drug, he's actually turning on the console mode 
in life. And he's beginning to see that flow and the connectivity and things like that. Um, you know, it's a long way to go before you fully understand it and get the full value out of it. But it's like opening up the console mode and the baffling things it throws up. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I think this last 15 minutes, um, listeners are going to listen again and again and again to it because it was so fascinating to, to, to hear that. Among other things, the most fascinating explanation of the Tree of Life I've ever heard, to be honest. <laughs> really? No, really. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's I, interesting I have because it's, um, it's very disreputable to draw parallels. And I've just drawn a parallel between evolution of human thinking the growing up of a child, uh, the way a computer's evolved, and the Kabbalah. Absolutely. Now, you see, it's, it's, scientists will say you can't draw parallels between separate things. And academics will say it's very dangerous to draw parallels across disciplines. Dangerous. But in artistic thinking, drawing parallels is heralded. If a literary critic takes 10 books off the shelf and says, basically, these are all telling the same story, They're all the myth of Oedipus. The critic will say, nonsense, they're, all, they're, they're different names of the people. They're set in different ages. This one's a fantasy. This one's a, um, a graphic novel. Totally different. But the, but the critic will be heralded for his subtle perception that however different they are, there is actually a similar theme running through them. He'll be congratulated for seeing parallels, whereas... A magician will be told he's being stupid, you see. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I, I believe uh, magic is a science and an art. I think it's, mm. it's to come to another yeah. type of vision. I have to ask you a final question. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time here, but I have to ask you one little thing. You said in the very beginning, and that kind of could round up our talk, um, that when you did your Abramelin experience, um, you first thought you would go somewhere out into the, into the countryside where would be alone but you would attract mm. attention in solitude well mm. i i can fully see what you mean by that um do you think that will ever change or is that a part of um, a part of the human way of being that um, things that you're supposed to do in solitude cannot really be done in solitude but have to hide in have to hide in in the general way of life? Um, I think we're talking about attention here. And actually, the article I've written for the next Fenris Wolf addresses that tension. Because I say that I, th I really believe that the challenge of the, what you might call the age of Aquarius, was coming up, is the individual and society and the tension between them. And I associate society with the group and i would say religion in the cultish sense you know that um the group mind the shared beliefs and things like that and science can be like that you know um when they say it must be objectively true they mean the group mind must accept it on good reasons yeah but it must be so magic i see is very much um is very individualist compared with that. And I gave the example about this question of, you know, truth and falsehood and um, fake news, where I said, I think the answer has to be looking it inside yourself. You know, um, you can't ignore the evidence that's given, but unless it makes sense inside you, um, you have to sort of judge it in your own way. Totally. So... I think this is all examples of this tension. And I think that um, uh, you can do wonderful group magic. It's very wonderful to, you know, join a circle around a fire and do things. Um, it's very lovely. But the real magical value of it tends to be what each person takes from it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in a religious thing, the real value is more what you as a group um, where you get to through it and like that. So um, it's very difficult to be precise about it, but I think there is a tension there. And I think we are beginning to explore that tension rather painfully at present. You mm -hmm. know, this cultish behavior and cultish um, aspirations and things like that. And 
uh, there's a, the curse of the loner. You know, um, if there's a shootout or something in a school, people say, well, he was a bit of a loner, as though that's a terrible thing and suspicious. Um, so there's this tension here. And I would uh, say it's something to do with the relationship between magic and the group mind. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I think, um, Carl, do you agree that is a great conclusion? Uh, Carl, Carl, when will that Fenris Wolf come out? Because that's your uh, that's you. It, it's, it will come out fairly soon, actually. Uh, uh, we're working uh, currently on, on two issues, uh, number 11 and number 12. They will be out in approximately the mm. same time, which I would say is May. So it's not that, okay. not that far away. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's oh. very close, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that's, a, that's a collapsing of time, isn't it? Two uh, Fenris <laughs> wolves on the same month. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> <be> every year. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Lionel, to be with us here today. That was a great experience. Really wonderful to have you. Um, thank you, Carl, for not only being at my side, but for having had the idea to invite Lionel and for being more, much more than a co-host here, uh, being my partner here on this show. And um, uh, well, have both a good time. Uh, let's see what the next few weeks and months will bring to us and the world. And um, thank you for this and goodbye for now. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you very much. Goodbye, and thank you very much for the opportunity you've given me. <laughs> hmm. Slow
Night Sea Journey by the great Wendy Rule, the former outro song of the Thought Hermes podcast. Lovely to hear that again and in its full length. And that was our special anniversary episode. Well, actually our special anniversary episode number one. Because as you might know, because I've told already several times in the earlier shows and on the internet everywhere, there will be a second special anniversary episode in two days' time on Friday. So a very, very special week. And of course, next Sunday, the usual regular episode, episode 9 of the season 8. Um, Friday, it'll be Ronnie Pontiac, who will be my guest. So stay tuned uh, talking about Manly P. Hall again. And um, on Sunday, it'll be Terry Simonson, and we will talk about everything paranormal. But from an outlook point, from an occult outlook and point of view. Right, so that's it. I don't have to say take care for a whole week, just for two days. And if you want, go on Kaikobat Radio. In the meantime, you will find the link on the Thought Hermes website, and I will post it on Facebook everywhere. Okay, have fun and enjoy the remainder of the already half week. Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.